So you are beloved here. Well, thank so, you very much. Thank you much. very much. And uh, as you know, you are a member of our international board of directors. So I may say to you, welcome home. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. So, please, do you want to sit down or do you want to stay? Oh, let's sit for a moment. Yeah, it's good. Do you know uh, this uh, product that I have in my, I hold in my hand? Yeah, I recognize you know that product. Okay. I have one myself, <laughs> the Big Brother. Uh, you, have, you have the Pro. I have the Surface, <laughs> the latest Surface too. I and, love uh, carrying my PC with me. I have been using it for two weeks now, and it's a great device. It's incredibly fast. I, I mean, it's only the Surface too, and is, it is as fast as a regular PC and uh, with all the productivity softwares in it, already embedded. And, uh, and so my first question is, Microsoft is known as being the leader and in a way the inventor, uh, you and Bill Gates, of the software industry. Are you now becoming a device company? Like, uh, like uh, sorry for that, but like HP, for instance? <laughs> well, uh, I would say something slightly different. What I would say is, in a way, yes, we've been a software company our whole history. And yet, if you think about it, really for much of that time, we've been involved in defining the future of a device called the PC. As much as almost anything, uh, Windows defined a PC and where it was going. Uh, what we have found as we move into new device categories we're certainly, we are, we're not the first in the markets. Uh, being able to think about and to innovate across hardware and software in a very agile way, whether that's in phones or in tablets, uh, we will do some hardware. We continue to, to love HP, Dell, Lenovo, Acer, Asus, Samsung, da 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 and many others. Uh, but we will do more hardware, uh, as we have with Xbox and uh, Surface. And with a little approval, phones with Nokia. Okay, we will, we will, we'll speak about phones. We'll talk about that. And uh, so it's a great device. Uh, to be uh, frankly, I think it's the best one on the market. Well, thank you. And uh, the price is very fair. It's less than 400 euros. It's 339, I think, for the, the, the low end. And uh, so it's a very good device. But how can you make this a best seller? Because uh, as you and me know, and everybody here in this room, uh, having the best device is not enough in this industry. You need some things that, is not def that we cannot define. And wh what is your plan to make this a bestseller before well, the, the iPad? I think there's, there's a couple or three things to think about. Uh, number one, uh, what you really want to have is a differentiated value proposition of some form. And I think uh, there's no doubt that if you want the device that will make you most productive, uh, I will argue that's the Surface. Now, there are people who will say that's not what I care about. I just want something very low end to watch movies, and there will be other solutions. But you need a differentiated value proposition. You need ongoing innovation. If I thought that the last thing that would happen in the next 10 years would look like a slab of metal, uh, and that there'd be no innovation in the hardware or the way the hardware and software interact, it would be a very different story. We have a lot of interesting things we're working on from an innovation perspective. And you know, you can look at an, even in an audience like this, can I call this one of the most tech savvy audiences that I would speak to in France? And I see tablets and I see Macs and PCs, but I also see something else in this audience, paper and pencils, a few. You're all looking around saying, oh, no, no, we're the most tech-savvy audience in France. There's no paper and pencils. And yet every meeting I go to, uh, we still haven't really, uh, as an industry, come up with a device that really in people's professional lives replace uh, everything that's come before. So we see a lot of opportunity yeah. for innovation. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, no, it's paper. I even have some myself. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I am old school, <laughs> you're right, to point this out. And uh, uh, we, we will talk about mobile devices later on, because that's a big topic of this meeting, of course. But first, let's come back on one of the uh, all-time bestsellers in the software industry, which is Windows. So you launched, 
some months ago, maybe eight months or maybe one year, I don't know. Win I, everything goes so fast. Uh, Windows 8 with yeah. good bears and also, the, let us confess, it, bad bears, some bad bears. And uh, recently you released the, the 8.1 version. So how, how, how are sales going? Uh, what, what does your uh, consumer studies tell you about uh, the acceptation by the public? Can you tell us some, give us some uh, insights? Yeah, there's how's the sales going and what feedback are we getting from the market? And certainly from a sales perspective, we've sold over 100 million units uh, approximately. Uh, we've reported the numbers and I, they may be slightly more or slightly less, but 100 million units in a year, pretty good. Uh, market feedback, uh, uh, certainly there are people who love Windows 8 and there are certainly people who will say it's not enough like Windows 7 and we heard the feedback, we brought back the start menu, we've done a number of things. Uh, we'll have people who say absolutely tablet concepts and desktop concepts should be available in one device. We have people who will tell us, absolutely, you should never put those two concepts in the same device. Uh, we get all that kind of feedback because what we did with eight was, I would say, pretty big, pretty bold. We're, we listened to the feedback. We've made a lot of responses in 8.1, uh, and we'll continue to move forward. So uh, I would call it controversial if you look, but loved by some and with some feedback. I'll also say that still uh, with our enterprise customers, Windows 7 remains the most popular and we're working on all the feedbacks we see coming in from enterprise people about making 8.1 a product they think they can put into their organizations. And, uh, are you satisfied with the sales numbers? Did you reach the targets? Well, what I would say is a little different. In general, 8 has done well and the real issue for us has been if you look at uh, the particularly a segment of consumer PC sales where people really just want to sit and watch things, uh, there's certainly been some impact that's come from tablets and we're working on that with, with other strategies with our OEMs. Okay, no numbers, no, uh, no announcement. Uh, well, no. It, then, then we're really talking about... the media? Well, no, no, then we're talking about <laughs> how many PCs are selling, how many Windows devices are selling, and I think IDG and Gartner, many people will, will give of estimates course, on that, course, on that of number. Course, of course, And um, does this tablet uh, announce the merger of uh, fixed computers and uh, mobile devices? How do you see the frontier, the border between those two markets and those two usages? Well, I don't think there's any rigid boundary between anything. Obviously, a phone is different than a tablet, but then you've got phablets in between, very large screen phones. Uh, there's no firm line on when you stop using one product and start using the next. There's no firm line, actually, between tablets and PCs. This is a PC. Yes. This is certainly a PC in every sense. It runs every program. It's got an x86 in it. Uh, even when you go to bigger devices, we now make uh, an 80 uh, inch tablet. 80 inch tablet is a very big tablet, of course. You tend to hang them on walls, but I think users do like the idea of having some family characteristics. They can get access to their data, they can share in certain ways, they have access to certain applications. So we're working on it as if it's a family with no firm line between the categories. Okay, okay. So I may work on it as on a regular PC, as I would a on a regular absolutely. PC. Absolutely, that's your view. absolutely. Okay. Word, Excel, PowerPoint, okay. Outlook, Link, it's all there. There, are, there, are, there have all also been a big change in the model of, uh, in the business model of Microsoft. That's the launch of the, um, the Office Suite uh, 365. And uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, there's no question that the future of, of software of all forms is to be delivered as a service from the cloud whether it's to the enterprise or to the consumer. The consumer market has gone more quickly, but now the enterprise market is moving. Uh, Office 365 is already the number one SaaS application in the world. We have more 
enterprise seats than anybody would have, than Salesforce or anybody else would have. It's the number one SaaS application. It's moving tremendously well. It's obviously got a different business model because we have to have data centers and servers and you know, it's different than handing somebody a DVD. Uh, it's a very different experience, a different economic model, but we're very excited about what it means for growth opportunities for us. And uh, how do you see the, the balance between the, the, sale, the sale of licenses and the sale of 365 uh, products? Well, so in percentage. Right now, the services are small, still in revenue, but growing rapidly in terms of the number of uh, seats committed from our, our customers, but still relatively, it's a software-dominated revenue stream, but if you go out over the next 10 years, there's no question, five years maybe even, services will dominate from a revenue and profitability perspective. Okay. And uh, uh, for a user, what is preferable, to buy a license once for all or to, uh, to, to pay every year uh, a fee? For a, a business customer, it's over, I believe, it's overwhelmingly a good value to, to go with the service. It's constantly updated. The IT department doesn't need to deploy servers, and we do all of that for you. For a consumer, I also believe the service is the better value, but some consumers like to pay once and, and be done. And we respect yeah. our customers' interests. That's mine. That's mine. I own it. You own all the office software that's exactly. built into here, and we love you for that. <laughs> And let's, let's talk now about the, um, the smartphone market. Um, you, you finally acquired Nokia or part of Nokia. Can you tell us why? Why, why you did so? Because, it's, because you, now you are a device uh, actor, an actor of the device industry. And what did you buy within Nokia exactly? Because it, it was not completely clear for everybody, I think. Not for me. <laughs> okay. Nokia's got a lot of pieces. Uh, they have a mapping service. We didn't buy that. Uh, we did do a contract to be a good customer of their mapping. So we are a very good customer of their maps. We did not buy maps. They make base stations for wireless networks. We didn't buy that. Uh, they have a huge patent portfolio. We didn't buy it, but we paid for a license for that. And then they have a phone business, both feature phones and smartphones. We bought that. <laughs> Thank you very much. In, in our, yes, and did you buy the division which recently launched the Nokia tablet as I did. well? You yes, did. we did. You we did. did. So, so you have two products in competition right now. We do, except we don't own Nokia yet. The European <laughs> Commission, for example, has not approved it. Okay. So they have one and we have one. Uh, with luck, we'll have two, and when we have two, I just hope they're both selling very well, and then we have opportunities to think about it. Actually, today, if you want a um, tablet with Windows RT in it that uh, attaches to cellular networks, the only product that does that is the Nokia product. Okay. Uh, there is another sector in the Internet, I mean, a, um, a domain in the Internet field, which you are not an actor of, but maybe you, you will tell me the contrary, it's the social networks. What is, there, what is your strategy in social networks? There is Twitter, there is Facebook, where, where is Microsoft? If, if Microsoft should be somewhere in this domain. Well, we're actually an, an active player in what I would call aspects of social networking. Uh, there's no firm definition of what a social network is, but everybody would say Facebook is one and everybody would say Twitter is one for enterprises that want to be have social networking inside the company we've got a very successful offering called yammer uh, most people would not refer to uh, products that help you communicate point to point like skype as a social network and yet if you look at the 300 uh, million people who use skype they use it to socialize there's no question uh, and we would certainly say it's part of the social fra fabric of the, the way people work and live. Uh, we like kind of our footprint. We're going to grow the capabilities that you see in Skype, 
Uh, we're growing the capabilities that you see in Yammer. Uh, we think Twitter's doing a fine job. And yesterday, I guess you would say, the world agrees that they're doing a fine job uh, at what they do, Facebook at what they do. Uh, Google's tried a little bit, uh, but struggled against Facebook, I would say, with Google Plus. But that's their, that's their fight to fight, so to speak. And uh, how is Yomer doing right now? What about the sales? Is the, is the are the enterprises uh, using it more and more? Yeah, actually, it's doing doing quite well. Uh, we don't disclose specific sales results no. because it's part of other contracts. Okay. But remember, Yammer has a free model. Anybody can use Yammer, any company, for free. And it's only if the IT department wants to put on some extra. Uh, controls and protections that you pay for it. But it has grown dramatically in the year and a half that we've owned it. There is a question that your friend Sim wanted uh, that I ask you, but I do not really understand it, so I will just read it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Our French team gets to <laughs> pose a question to me anyway. The way businesses and customers interact is changing, okay, in the digital area, sorry. How can companies harness technology to improve and evolve the customer experience? Do, yeah. you, do you understand the question? I do. This okay. is, I do. Well, for business customers, this is probably effectively the question I get asked most often. Uh, if you're the CEO of a business, you say, okay, how's this internet thing going to let me get more customers, serve my customers better, give them a better experience? What's the next frontier? That's, that is a very prominent question. You will say, the customers will say to me, will I be able to really conduct seminars in an effective way online? Will I really be able to use big data to tailor what I show individual customers who visit me to, so they see exactly the right product for them and not a bunch of other products? Can I change the way we do customer support and service because of what these next generation sensors. I mean, literally, I was with a group of manufacturing companies in Germany, and they all want to put sensors in their products so that they can uh, enhance them and fix them and modify them and change the way that they work with their customers in the new digital age. Uh, the notion that says, there was a guy from an elevator company, and all the elevator sensor data needs to get sent back so that they can constantly tune the power consumption and eco-friendliness of the elevator. That's all about, essentially, how businesses transform their relationship with their customers. And we think you can say, well, everybody has a website today. But tomorrow, this will be the, probably for most businesses, the most exciting frontier uh, that next generation internet opens up in terms of changing how they, they work. So it was an important question. Actually, yeah, you have a good, it is. You have a good Maybe hard to understand, but uh, <laughs> it is very much on business people's minds. What about the advertising market? You, you stepped back a little on this market. You, uh, you were a big actor of advertising market. Is this still uh, a very important market for you? Uh, what I would say, yes. What I would say is advertising, is advertising a market? Or is the market for social network, for a search engine, for a portal. I think the market, as you see it from the consumer perspective, is to use some service. And then the question is, how do you make any money? Well, you make money by selling advertising. And so in a sense, what I would say is, are we keen on pursuing consumer services that are primarily funded by advertising and the answer is yes, and the most obvious of those, of course, is Bing. Uh, you know, we have invested quite a bit in Bing. The product has improved dramatically. Uh, great in the U.S. We are running all these advertisements to tell people to compare Bing and Google. We've made a lot of progress, not that much progress, but, but a lot of progress in France, in the U.K. Uh, we've built Bing into Windows 8.1 with a feature we call Bing Smart Search. It's built into Xbox. It's built into our phones. So do we believe in search engine? Yes. Uh, are we, do we have incredible ad capabilities around that? In fact, that's one of our fastest growing businesses is our search advertising business has been booming up about 45% in the last year.
Are you going to sell advertising space, uh, I mean advertising, on the Office Suite, on Excel, or on, uh, on Word 3, 365, for instance? I'm not sure it's a, uh, maybe, but right now if you ask me, is that a huge opportunity, I would say probably not a huge opportunity. We'd prefer to have, find customers who value the product and want to sure, use it, sure, sure. or give it for free. If it means we have to read through your spreadsheets uh, to find the right ad the uh, way our uh, competitor does. That's too much. No, thank uh, you. We're not yeah. going to do, uh. we, don't read our, we don't read our customers' mail to pick advertising. We'll leave that to others in the market. Great. <laughs> uh, we are only 50 days before Christmas holidays, and of course that's a big period for companies li like yours. And uh, what, what are your, your new, the new devices that you will put on the market on, on this occasion? Well, <laughs> because it's already early November, we have some products we've already brought to market, like the new yeah, Surface yeah, Pros, one, yeah. but the one that's still coming will be Xbox One. Simply the best gaming experience possible for Christmas 2013. <laughs> We are, we are in this famous video of 1986. Ah, I had to repeat it for you. <laughs> and uh, how with the, we, we are talking about games, how is electronic games, the business model of electronic games changing? How is it changing right now? What are your, your views in this domain? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say something different than changing. Sure. I think there will be a number of interesting models for game experiences, and it'll depend upon the nature of the game. The emerging model that uh, people have done very well on is uh, freemium games, but where the payoff isn't in advertising, it's in you know small micro payments, transactions for digital, uh, for, for hints, for tips, for expertise, for additional characters, for gifts. That has really grown nicely as a business model. Uh, for a number of people. I still think there will be a, a, a market for, vi and those generally have low initial production costs, and then the author builds the game over time. But then you'll get these big, uh, like hit movies, the equivalent of a hit movie where you put in huge production values and art, like on Xbox games, and if the production cost is huge, the appropriate business model is probably to ask the user to pay up front as opposed to having more of a freemium model to start with. So at least both of those two models I think are quite promising uh, for the future, but the, it's for different kinds of games. If you want huge, rich production, which is what many Xbox gamers want, then you probably pay some up front, and if you want more casual gaming that you can grow into, these freemium models are working well. Uh, what do you think about the future of the Kinect? Can, you, can, can people use the Kinect for other youth ages than uh, playing? Yeah, absolutely. It's I, a very powerful tool. The, the new Kinect uh, sensor that's built into the Xbox One is, is phenomenal. It literally can even spot fingers moving. Now you say, why is that important? Because when you start to get to applications even beyond gaming, or even if you think about doing games where you want to see somebody, I don't know, shooting, this is shooting a bow and arrow as done by a guy who's never shot one, <laughs> uh, but shooting bows and arrows. Uh, if you want to simulate, over time I think you're going to let people simulate, for example, you're watching your favorite football match and, uh, what's the guy's name, Ibra Van... Who, who, I am not going to try. I am a paper Sultan, user. The new, the, this, we, apparently, we, we've been working a partnership with this guy. For, he's a Swedish guy who plays for Saint Germain. I'm not going to try to pr pronounce the name. I'll screw it up. But anyway, you know, let's say you watch a kick on television, and you say, "Wow, could I make that kick?" And in your own living room, you can be projected into the field. You can try the kick. The Kinect will recognize everything that you do and project the ball. Now, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting so close. Is that a game? Is that TV entertainment? Whew. Health, health applications. The more we can see of you, a lot of doctors will say, look, for old people in their homes, the number one thing is if we could just 
see them and get an estimate of weight changes, that would be hugely valuable in providing kind of early warning on home health. So whether it's health or entertainment, uh, education, the ability for a child to interact and speak and have the device really recognize them, we think there's, there's very many good applications uh, for the Kinect, which is why we would call the Xbox One future-proof. What do you put behind those, those two words, uh, serious fan? What, what does it mean? Well, in a sense, you can go back to the discussion we just had on gaming models. Yeah, sure. I would call a lot of the freemium models allow you to start casually and grow serious. We start you serious. When you look at these Xbox games, for example, that will come out with the Xbox One, I know what will happen at my house. My sons will say, Dad, we have work to do. We've got to go beat the games. And then they'll disappear for three days. And I'll say, what did you do? And they'll say, we're on level 22, Dad. We're still working. <laughs> that okay. strikes me as serious. The person who wants to make that kick, that's serious fun. That's not the person who just wants to lay on the couch and watch the match. Serious fun. <laughs> Let, let's, uh, let's talk a bit now about Microsoft as an organization. Uh, how many people work for Microsoft uh, now? Approximately 100,000. 100,000. So, how can you... Before the Nokia acquisition. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then 130,000. Okay. So, how can you foster innovation in, in such large company? Uh, because innovation is part of individual creativi creativity. So people need some freedom and need to show that they can also be a, an entrepreneur within Microsoft. How do you foster, foster that? Well, I would say innovation has at least two or three different aspects, actually. Uh, much of it is bottoms up from individuals. And there is so much room in Microsoft to do that. There's room in our research organization where everybody's in essentially a team of one, two, three people. In our development organizations, you may see the field as being broad or you know, you're working in one area, but you get to innovate a lot in that area. The other is the top-down aspect of innovation, which is really picking kind of directions and major uh, areas to, to pursue. And innovate, good innovation is a mix of top down and bottoms up. I think the popular culture would say it's all bottoms up, one, two, three people. And yet if you look at sort of some of the brilliance of, of, of some companies, it generally comes because a founder or somebody said, we're going this way and then got everybody to innovate along that path. And some of our success, some of Apple's success, I think, isn't all from the bottom. It's from picking key directions and key new technologies to bet on. Let, let, us, let us talk about you now, Steve Ballmer. You joined Microsoft in 1980, correct? But you knew Bill Gates a long time before. And because you, you were at the university with, the, with Bill. And, uh, and now you're going to leave the company. Is that sure, 100% sure? Are, are, are aren't there some chances that you may stay at Microsoft? Well, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I love Microsoft. Uh, I made a, a decision uh, for me uh, that I thought it was, I knew I, I want to do something. I want to have an active life that's not just being at Microsoft. I, I always knew that. Uh, I have a, I, my, my youngest son will go to college in a couple of years. My initial plan had been to, to, to transition when he transitions. But we're at a point now at Microsoft where we're really pivoting, as you noted, on devices and services. And I thought it's probably better for the health of the company to, trans, to transition now, to let a new leader uh, take that. So we announced in August that with, within less than or equal to 12 months, uh, we would have a new leader. Uh, I don't anticipate that changing. I'm still working very hard, charging very hard. But when we have a new leader, we have a new leader. 
Okay, do you know his name or her name? I, 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 A, I do not, and B, I would not share it. Okay. <laughs> and what about you? What are you going to do? You cannot be a, a, a retired. That's not compatible with your personality. No, the word retired was probably not the best choice because I, I'm not going to sit and, fish? I don't know, watch the yeah. fish. No, 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 not me. Uh, I, I'm, I scare the fish. Uh, <laughs> No, I, well, the thing I agreed with my wife is take a few months. I want to decide what to do and probably do a few things. I'd like to study. I actually have some things I'd like to go back to school maybe and study. I have an interest in traveling more than I've been able to travel personally. I have an interest in maybe teaching a little bit. I have an interest in actually Maybe studying some French again, because I don't... Spoke French. Here, he, he, with Thierry Breton some years ago. I did. I remember, at the Senate. And I yeah. need to study some more. <laughs> That's what you know, number one. I have an interest in, in maybe helping bring a professional basketball team to Seattle, where I live, which would be exciting. I have some interest in some boards. The healthcare system in the United States is, seems not to be working very well. I have some interest in learning more and seeing if there's a way. So I have about 15 things I'd like to figure out whether I really want to spend time on. So I'll, I'll learn, and I'm really excited to learn. And you know, I, I'll be 58 by the time I leave, I suspect, uh, pretty close to it. And I'm really excited. I'll have 10 years where maybe four or five things will keep me charging and excited and fired up. That's my entrepreneurial question. If you were French uh, here in France, and if you were a young entrepreneur, would you create your startup here in France, or would you go somewhere else uh, in the Bay Area, for instance? <laughs> uh, what would I, no, let, let's, what would you, what would you do? You'd have to think about that question. That's, and it, it's not, and the way you asked it is perfectly correct. The question is, what, is not would you start it in France or in the U.S. You wouldn't start it in the U.S. You would start it either in France or in the Bay Area. It's, it's literally the Bay Area. You wouldn't move to Chicago, I, at least I would tell you. Unless you're going to go to the Bay Area, you absolutely should start, start in France. People do understand that there's this amazing ecosystem of talent and entrepreneurs and venture capital. Do you have to go to, to the Bay Area? No, you do not have to go to the Bay Area. But it is, what I would probably say for most people is, you should start your business in your home. So start in France. But make sure you have strong connections with everything that's going on, particularly in Silicon Valley. Uh, that's easier to say, Bill Gates started our business in Seattle because he was from there, but we're only an hour and a half flight from Silicon Valley, so that, that's a little easier. But everybody who starts a, a tech company will want to know what's going on in the Valley, may want access to capital for the Valley. So I don't tell you to start your business there, but don't put your head down. See what's going on in the world, and particularly, I have to say, the world of Silicon Valley is very important. Steve, I promised your team to let you go at 10.15 for your other appointments, and my last question is, will we stay in touch? Absolutely. Steve B. at Microsoft.com, <laughs> at least for much. now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Very You're much. great. You're the best. Thank you.